Grace and peace be multiplied to each of you tonight in the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. Let me publicly express, as I have privately, my great appreciation to Pastor Caldwell for extending this invitation to me again to come this way to be a part of this meaningful time together. I am encouraged by these faithful men who I have the privilege of sharing this platform with over the weekend. Grateful and thankful to God for the witness of this pastor and congregation and for this time together tonight in God's Word. If you would get your copy of God's Word, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Let me breathe a prayer and ask God to help us to hear clearly and speak faithfully. And then I want you to hear the reading of God's Word, and then we'll consider together tonight what God will say to us right out of what He has already said to us in His Holy Word. Let's pray. Indeed, Heavenly Father, we praise You for the indescribable gift of Your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our all-sufficient prophet, priest, and king. We give you praise for the privilege of being together tonight and over the course of this weekend and for this time now in your word and under your word. We pray that you would open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things from your word. We pray that you would help us tonight to lay aside all malice, deceit, envy, hypocrisy, and slander so that as newborn infants, we may crave the pure and spiritual milk of your word and grow thereby, having tasted of your goodness. Grant me tonight physical strength and spiritual energy to speak your word faithfully and clearly guide my thoughts, guard my heart, and govern my words so that everything I say would be consistent with sound doctrine. And as the seed of the word is planted and watered, we know that only you can give the increase. So we reserve for you, as always, the highest praise and full credit for the fruit that shall come from this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Amen. Permit me to label the message tonight, Preaching Truth in a Culture of Lies preaching truth in a culture of lies. Samuel Langhorn Clemens, better known by his pen name Mark Twain, went to church one Sunday. After the service, he spoke to the pastor and told the pastor that he had a book at home with every word in it that the pastor had spoken in his sermon that day. The pastor assured Clemens that he had not plagiarized that message. In essence, the message was original, but Clemens insisted that he had a book at home with every word in it that the pastor had spoken in the message. And as he insisted, the pastor asked to see the book. The next day, Clemens sent over the book, and when the pastor opened the parcel, 
he found a dictionary. <laughs> and in the flyleaf, Clemens wrote words, just words, just words. Brothers and sisters, how much preaching today can be described that way. Words. Just words. So much so-called preaching is actually just words that there is now a conspiracy against preaching. The unbelieving world dismisses preaching as religious nonsense. Many churches would prefer pulpit entertainment rather than Bible exposition. And some pastors would rather be life coaches rather than faithful heralds of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. This sad indictment should not surprise us, however. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 warns, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Paul predicted that Timothy would live and minister in a time of trouble, a time of difficulty, a time of peril. But the beauty is, as you read through 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul does not give Timothy a new strategy for the changing times. He simply instructs Timothy to stick with the scriptures no matter what's going on in the society around you. Why continue in the word? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 answer, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped, for every good work. That 16th verse declares that the word of God is sufficient for Christian maturity. That 17th verse declares that the word of God is sufficient for Christian ministry. The Bible, the word of God is able to make the man of God complete and equipped for every good work. What good work? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5 answers that question for us tonight. There are nine imperatives, nine commands in these five verses. The first is the foremost that confronts us tonight with the truth that biblical preaching is the first work of a faithful ministry. I would consider myself a student and an advocate of expositional preaching, that preaching that seeks to simply explain the God-intended meaning of the text and exhort the hearer to properly respond to the truth of God's word in repentance, trust, and obedience. But I don't believe that expositional preaching is just a style of a sermon. I believe it's a view of scripture. You ask why exposition? My elevator answer is because 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 come right after 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. In the real sense, brothers and sisters, 
how a man preaches betrays what he really thinks about the word of God. To trust the scriptures is to teach the scriptures. Second Timothy chapter four, verses one through five is often used in pastoral ordinations and installations and conferences and rightly so. But let me press in to affirm that this charge to the preacher is a charge to the church. Pierre Marcel said it well, that preaching is the central, definitive, and primary function of the church. Not just the preacher, but the church. Yes, the church is and does more than preaching, but the preaching of God's word must be essential to all that the church is and does. And even though they may not recognize it, the unsaved and the unchurched also desperately need biblical preaching. Romans 10, verse 14, rightly asks, how shall they hear without someone preaching to them? It has been and remains the will of God to save the lost and sanctify the church through truth-driven, gospel-saturated, Christ-exalted preaching. So what does it mean to preach truth in a culture of lies? Several answers I would lift as we walk through the verses before us tonight. First, the text bids us to preach the word dutifully. Preach the word dutifully. Verse 1 says, I charge you. The word charge refers to a military command or a legal affirmation. It means to order or to adjure or to implore. And this is where the text starts. Paul uses forceful language to call Timothy to preach truth in a culture of lies. But this solemn charge is not about the relationship between Paul and Timothy. This solemn charge is about the relationship between Timothy and the Lord. Verse 1 makes it clear that Timothy, in a real sense, is to preach to an audience of one. What difference? would our lives be and our ministries be if we lived and ministered with a conscious sense of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ? What would be different about how we do church if we truly believed that Jesus is present now and is coming again? This is what Paul declares in verse 1. He first, on one hand, says that Jesus is present now. I charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus. Not long after penning this letter, the apostle Paul would move off the scene and no longer be a part of Timothy's life. But he wants to make it clear that Someone, capital S, someone would be present monitoring Timothy's ministry. And thus he was to proclaim the truth in the presence of the Godhead. I charge you, he says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. Don't don't dismiss the, the word presence here. Presence means more than the Godhead is there as a court reporter. The, the Godhead is the Supreme Court. 
to which he must give an account. What a verse. Here, Paul ascribes omniscience to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This verse affirms John chapter 10, verse 30, where Jesus says, I and the Father are one. And he says this this God and Christ Jesus will judge the living and the dead. We naturally assume and think of God being the judge on that last day in the final inspection. But Jesus says in John chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, for the Father judges no one but has given all judgment to the Son that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who has sent him. Jesus Christ is the judge to whom we must give an account for our faithfulness to the truth on that great day of final inspection, and all will give an account to him, verse 1 says, the living and the dead. On that great day, the living will bow the knee to Jesus, and the dead will rise to bow the knee to Jesus. And it is this Jesus in whose scrutinizing presence we proclaim and defend the truth. He is present now, but he is also coming again. Verse 1 says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge, the living and the dead, and by his appearing, his shining forth, reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ. In the real sense, this is, a, this is the open secret for ministerial faithfulness. It is to live in anticipation of the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul did not live to see that day, but he lived every day in anticipation of that day. It is rightly said that there were only two days on Paul's calendar, today and that day. And he lived and ministered in light of the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Matthew chapter 6 verse 10 teaches us to pray, your kingdom come. The coming of the Christ will be the consummation of the kingdom, and he will reign freely and fully and finally. And Paul presents these grave truths as the foundational basis of ministerial accountability. Beyond what the crowd does, beyond what the culture is up to, We must give an account to the Lord Jesus Christ for our faithfulness. He, verse 8, is the righteous judge who will give a crown of righteousness to those who are faithful to him. Since we're in a gym, let me say, Size and celebrity and success will not be on heaven's scoreboard. But we must give an account to the Lord Jesus Christ for our faithfulness to the truth of his word. And so we must preach the word dutifully. Secondly, we must preach the word diligently. Verse 1 is a 
There's a lot of gravity here. The Holy Trinity, the final judgment, the second coming. He places all of this on the shoulders of Timothy as he issues this charge. He places the weight of eternity on Timothy's shoulder to get his full attention. And now, beginning of verse 2, he issues the charge. What, what, what is, what, what duty, what task, what work is so important? That he invokes the Godhead and the final judgment and the second coming and the consummated kingdom. Well, it's worth exegeting the white spaces between verse 1 and verse 2 and considering what Paul does not say. So much that we would put on a ministerial job description in the contemporary church is not mentioned here. The all-consuming focus is to preach the word. It's a call to biblical preaching. There are five commands in this second verse, but the latter are, are just a reinforcement and an emphasis of the first, preach the word. The term here for preach would have been understood originally as a political one, not a religious one. It, it was a reference to the function of the herald. An ancient king or ruler could not just go into his press room and give a speech that would be carried on satellite for everyone around his kingdom to see. And so he would send out his herald to proclaim a royal birth or a legal verdict or a military victory. And when that herald would show up in the town or city or village, he would lift his voice in a stern and solemn manner and boldly proclaim the message of the king. And as the herald spoke, the people had better Listen and take heed, for to reject the message of the herald would be to reject the authority of the king. And yet at the same time, the herald must be diligent to proclaim the message of the king diligently, faithfully, clearly. The text here calls on Timothy, calls the preacher to be the Lord's herald, the Lord's messenger, the Lord's spokesman. But it is clear that the messenger does not have editorial control over the message. In fact, would you note he does not tell Timothy merely that he must preach. He tells him what he must preach. Preach the word. Preach the word. We don't get to pick the message. The message has been entrusted to us. And faithfulness requires that we preach the word. The power. is in the content of the preaching, not the function of the preacher. Or if I could say it another way, it's not our preaching that makes the gospel work, it's the gospel that makes our lousy preaching work. And so the question is never, 
can a man preach? The question is always, what does that man preach? What does he preach? When the Presbyterian pastor and author died February 19, 1957, Clarence McCartney, a couple of days before his brother came to visit him on his way to preach and noted, Robertson did, that as he was departing, he heard his brother say as he went to preach, put all the Bible into it that you can. This is what Paul is charging us to do when he bids us to preach the word, to, to, put it, to, to make sure that our proclamation is faithful to the revealed truth of sacred scripture. And so there's a call to biblical preaching, and then there is a call to bold preaching. Be ready in season and out of season. On one hand, this is a call to prepare. You must first get ready in order to be ready. A passion to preach without a commitment to study is just a desire to perform. You must get ready in order to be ready. But this is more than a call to Prepare, it, it, the heart of this is a call to perseverance. You to be ready in season and out of season. In season, when it is an opportune time, the term is used in Mark 14 to describe how Verses 10 and 11 there, how Judas was looking for a good opportunity, the right opportunity to sell Jesus out. And out of season. When it doesn't seem to be the right time or a good opportunity or a favorable setting. This exhortation is to both the preacher and the hearer. It is on one hand a statement to the preacher. It is saying to the preacher, yes, you want to be faithful and fruitful, but you must remain faithful even when it seems you are not being fruitful. Now, most likely this is a reference to the hearer. A statement about the hearer. Bluntly, Paul is saying to Timothy, keep preaching when they want to hear you and when they don't want to hear you. Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 7, you will speak my word to them whether they hear or whether they refuse to hear, for this is a rebellious house. But a rebellious house is no excuse to be an unfaithful preacher. You're to preach the word, being ready in season and out of season. McDonald simply comments here that the word is in season at all times, even when it seems to some to be out of season. So there's a call to biblical preaching, and there's a call to bold preaching, and there is a call to balanced preaching. Three more commands, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Reprove is preaching to convince the hearer. Rebuke is preaching to convict the hearer. Exhort is preaching to correct the hearer. That's the high task. How do you faithfully preach in a way that reproves the mind, rebukes the emotions, and exhorts the will? Paul says you do so with complete patience and teaching. 
If I may confess, since the beginning of my ministry decades ago, I have been committed to the top of verse 2, preach the word. It has taken years, and I am still learning to be committed to the end of verse 2. Complete patience. Let me give a better. The, the, the old King James is better here. Long suffering. <laughs> the word works. It just doesn't work according to our schedule. D. Martin Lewis joins us right that it is one thing to love to preach, but it is quite another thing to love those to whom you preach. But may I add to that? That love must not be equated with compromise. To love those to whom you preach is to keep preaching the truth to them no matter what. The verse begins with a reference to preaching. The verse ends with a reference to teaching. And, and I, don't, I don't see too hard a distinction between those two words in the New Testament. What, one can teach without preaching, but, but, but one cannot truly preach without teaching. Faithful preaching requires doctrinal teaching. In fact, the very basic work of disciple making requires Matthew 28 20 that we be teaching all to observe all that Christ has commanded us music programs events can fill rooms but if you're going to make disciples someone must teach the word so that the people of God may learn to think and act biblically Preach the word dutifully, Paul then says. Preach the word diligently. Thirdly, he says, preach the word defiantly. Preach the word defiantly. Verses 3 and 4 explain the reason for the charge in verses 1 and 2. It is a prophetic warning. It factors in how depravity can corrupt the ministry of the word if we are not determined to preach the truth in the culture of lives. Paul makes a twofold prediction here. He says, on one hand, people will reject the truth. The time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. People here, they, depending on the translation in your lap, re refers to, yes, hardened unbelievers, but also to professing believers. There are spiritual counterfeits in the church who are exposed by their unwillingness to endure healthy teaching. When I was a very young preacher, there would be an older man that would come hear me, and if he caught me before the service, he would say, now listen, little reverend, don't try to learn me nothing tonight. Just make me feel good. <laughs> And um, very few would be so bold as to say that directly, but there are many who come to church on the Lord's Day with that sentiment. Don't try to learn me anything. Just make me feel good. Paul says this is the sign of spiritual counterfeits. They will find healthy or health-giving truth to be intolerable. They, they can't endure it because they have itching ears 
that crave to hear something new or novel. And there are people who just will not be able to sit under the sound teaching of God's word. They, they want something that will confirm their sinful standards. And so they'll, they'll accumulate for themselves. This is graphic language. They'll, they'll, just, they'll heap up for themselves teachers to say what they want to hear. People who love their sin more than they love Christ. Crave preaching that affirms their sinful passion. In Paul's correspondence to Timothy, there's, there's a lot he says about false teachers, but this is, an, this is an important statement about the other side of the coin. Here he is saying that false teachers wouldn't have a platform if it wasn't for worldly-minded people in the church. Marvin Vincent notes here that when the people desire a calf to worship, a ministerial calf maker is readily available. And so on one hand, they reject truth. But in rejecting truth, he says, on the other hand, they pursue lies. Notice how he describes this. Verse 4, he describes it as a turning away, which is active and aggressive language. That they can't tolerate life giving truth. But they they want to they want to keep doing the religious thing. So, so they sit under teaching. They, they accumulate for themselves teachers who let them continue to participate in this false presumption of, of the, the genuine thing by tickling their ears and affirming their sinful passions. And in the process, they... They turn away from listening to the truth. Well, you notice he doesn't say they turn away from listening to preaching. It's not that they, they got a problem with preaching. They have a problem with the truth. Jeremiah chapter 5. Verses 30 and 31, an astonishing and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. And the priests rule according to their own will. That's not the it's terrible, astonishing thing. The terrible, astonishing thing is, the verse says, my people love to have it so. The chapter ends with the question, but what will you do in the end? <laughs> they will turn away from listening. We live in a day where professing believers will entertain personal opinion, worldly philosophy, mystical ideas, prophetic mumbo-jumbo, charismatic nonsense and just can't tolerate sound doctrine. And they've turned away from listening to the truth. I need to move on. But just, just note the definite article. <laughs> Let me just pause and put a footnote there. And note, let me double-click the definite article there before the truth. 
Truth is rightly preceded by the definite article, not by personal pronouns. You don't have your own truth. There's only one truth, and that's God's truth, or it is a lie. But there will be those who will, on one hand, turn away active and then wander off passively into myths. Wandering off here is a term which speaks of the dislocation of a limb. They, they won't hear the health-giving truth. So their profession of faith is dislocated, and they wander off into myths. I appreciate the black and white nature of this statement. When a man stands to preach, either he is preaching the truth or he is preaching myths. (laughs) Either he looked it up or he made it up. Abraham Lincoln once asked, how many legs does a dog have if you call its tail a leg? His answer was four. Just because you call something a thing don't make it so. And so Paul says, preach the word dutifully, preach the word diligently, preach the word defiantly. Finally, he says, preach the word devotionally. Verse 5, as for you. That phrase weighs heavy on me. I hope it does for you. Let the crowd do what the crowd is going to do. Ask for you. Let the culture do what the culture is going to do. The the world is the world. You must not allow what what the world does to shape your commitment. As for you, stay the course. No matter what direction the world is going in, even when so many churches are going to stray, as for you, stay the course. How? He says, always be sober-minded. This is the word for sobriety, metaphorically here. It is more about alertness than abstinence. It is, it is to be watchful, to be alert, to be focused. Kenneth Weiss just notes here bluntly, there is no place for clowning in the pulpit of Jesus Christ. This is not just about the pulpit. Life and ministry is spoken of here. You're to keep your head at all times. Endure suffering. To endure suffering, you must expect suffering. Not ecclesiastical prominence or denominational stature or worldly success. You must, 2 Timothy 2, 3, endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Mark it down, friends. Faithful ministry is spiritual warfare. You must endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. We don't know if Timothy had the gift of an evangelist, but he he was to do the work of the evangelist. I think this is another way of saying what Paul has said in verse 2. To preach the word is to do the work of an evangelist. (laughs) 
we must minister as those who believe that the truth of Jesus Christ is the good news. It's the only good news that can save this world. In fact, this good news is not just good news. It is at the same time bad news, worse news, good news, and best news. The bad news is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and we must give an account to God for how we have lived our lives. The worst news is that there is nothing we can do to fix what our sins have broken. All of our righteous deeds are as a polluted garment before our righteous God. But the good news is, Jesus, God's son, came into the world who lived as our prophet, who died as our priest, and who rose as our king. He died at the cross to make atonement for our sins and rose from the dead for our justification. And that's not even the best part. The best news tonight, friend, is if you were invited here and don't know this Jesus for yourself, if tonight you repent of your sins, run to the cross, throw yourself on the mercy of God and trust in the bloody cross and empty tomb of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can leave here tonight with free forgiveness, new life, and eternal hope. And may we, Romans 1, never be ashamed of that message. Whereas Galatians 1.28 says, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ Jesus. Finally, Paul says, fulfill your ministry, which in a real sense is just a summary statement of the previous eight commands. It is a reminder that anyone can start fast. The question tonight is, will you finish strong? As we heard Dr. Lawson challenge us tonight, press on to the end. Verses 6 through 8, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. On a hill far away, stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. But I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross. To my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it one day for a crown. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for its divine nature, its clear truth, its saving message, it's total sufficiency. And I pray, Father, that as the times grow more perilous and more lies become prevalent, not just in the culture around us that we live in, but even in the midst of pulpits and churches that abandon divine truth for worldly myths. May we, Lord, 
by your grace, mercy, and help, hold fast to the truth and proclaim the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ in season and out of season. For the salvation of the lost, for the building up of your church, for the advancement of your kingdom, for the exaltation of your son, and for the glory of your name. We pray. Amen.